Okay, uh, so this was the uh, first thing we had given any real number there is a modulus or absolute value that is assigned to it r is plus r if it is r is positive minus r if r is negative 0 if r is 0 and the fundamental inequality is that mod absolute r plus s is less than mod r plus mod s and modulus of the difference between the moduli is less than or equal to the moduli of the difference okay. Now what uh, I want to do is I want to do real analysis and on the real line and simultaneously point out generalizations to various situations. So in order to get that thing organized uh, in addition to these inequalities I am going to now uh, give, uh, look at a string of inequalities okay. So our main uh, concern today will be inequalities. half the time uh, an analyst uh, spends on proving something or the other is less than or equal to something else or the other okay. So getting there are huge books on inequalities itself so, uh, there is a polia and hardy and little wood many 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 inequality books okay. So but we are not going to get into very complicated inequalities so we would start with certain inequalities that follow from a very fundamental fact. The most fundamental inequality is that x squared is greater than or equal to 0 for every real number x okay. That is a very simple fact but a very it can be uh, easily seen from the definitions of real numbers. So the square of a real number is always non-negative and it is equal to 0 if and only if that number is 0. Now most of the uh, inequalities that I am going to look at today will essentially come out of this. From this we will prove some things, from that we will prove something else. So this is the source of all the inequalities. The source in the sense we will apply this inequality with suitable x's okay and get the result different real numbers x applied will get this okay. So the most fundamental next fundamental inequality that arises out of this is what is known as the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality okay. So suppose a1, a2 are real numbers and both are greater than or equal to 0. So when something is 0 these things follow trivially so we could as well assume they are greater than 0. Then we define we call it for shorthand notation A as this vector and we will define the arithmetic mean of this to be A1 plus A2 by 2 and the geometric mean to be square root of A1 A2. Okay. There are many other means okay, uh, we will see at least one type of mean after this. The means are very mean okay, there are empty number of means that are there. So basically eventually say if you properly define your average things will work out, on an average it will work out okay. Uh, right. So uh, now let us take for example this simple apply this apply 1 with x equal to square root of a1 minus square root of a2 okay. What does that say then square root of a1 minus square root of a2 squared is greater than or equal to 0 x squared is greater than or equal to I put square root because I, I have to, I wanted to define geometric means so I have taken everything positive, uh, non-negative and so if you square this you get square root of a1 square is a1 plus a2 minus so I square root of a1 a2 greater than or equal to 0 
immediately giving us that square root of a1 a2 is less than or equal to a1 plus a2 by 2 or the geometric mean is less than or equal to the arithmetic mean. For any two numbers, any two real numbers, any two non-negative real numbers, the, the geometric mean is always smaller than the or equal to the arithmetic mean and equal will take place here, if equal takes place here, if equal takes place here, which will happen only when x is 0, that means a1 must be equal to a2. So, equality if and only if a1 equal to a2. So, we will just summarize, okay, then g a less than, this is the inequality, g a is less than or equal to a a equal if and only if a1 equal to a2. This is our second inequality, this is 1, okay. This is called the am gm inequality. Arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality. Okay. Uh, now look at the arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality. Here, what we are doing is to define the arithmetic mean. Uh, we are taking the average. While taking the average, we are giving equal weightage to the two values a1 and a2. Okay, half half. Suppose we distribute the weights in a different manner, lambda 1 weightage to a1 and lambda 2 weightage to a2, where lambda 1 and lambda 2 are between 0, 1 and lambda 1 plus lambda 2 equal to 1. So, the convex combination. So, so generalization. Same notation, let us now take lambda 1, lambda 2 between 0 and 1 and uh, lambda to be that vector just for notation. Then the geometric, the arithmetic mean with weightage lambda is defined as lambda 1 a1 plus lambda 2 a2. So, in other words, uh, a1 and a2 are two readings of some experiment. I have a little bit more confidence in certain readings, so I give more weightage to that. In the other reading, I give less weightage and then take the average. Okay. And then the geometric weighted mean is, in this case, when I define the geometric mean, I gave the exponent equally distributed. There, it was the other uh, average. Okay, this is in this the average is taken by giving the exponent. So it will be a1 power lambda 1 a2 power lambda 2, that is the weighted geometric mean. Then the question is, does the geometric arithmetic mean inequality hold even if the weighted case, okay, is the g lambda a less than or equal to a lambda a. Okay. And the answer is yes. Okay. So, uh, let me say first uh, conclusion I will write here so that we will note somewhere here. So, I will write uh, this a a a a g a, then g a is this and the third inequality is g lambda a is less than or equal to a lambda a and again all those equality I will not mention, okay. Now, what is the reason? Now, you will see that there are many things that are possible, okay. Uh, the reason is we want to prove that a1 power lambda 1 a2 power lambda 2 is less than or equal to lambda 1 a1 plus lambda 2 a2. This is what we want to prove because we are saying that is a true result. So, this will be true if well 
all are non negative real numbers. So, I can take logarithm on both sides. So, the log of this must be less than or equal to the log of this. If logarithm of a1 power lambda 1, a2 power lambda 2 is less than or equal to lambda 1, a1 plus lambda 2, a2. Okay. And um, this is that is if lambda 1 log a1 plus lambda 2 a log a2 is less than or equal to log lambda 1 a1 plus lambda 2 a2. You may ask what happens if something becomes 0 when one of them is 0, the inequalities are trivial. We do not have to worry, if I worry about the 0 case. So, I can take the logarithm. Okay. okay. Now, therefore, this is what we are want to prove. Uh, this follows from what uh, we call as the, the logarithmic function is a concave function. This is the definition of, this is sort of begging the question. Why is this true? Uh, because log is concave function. What is a concave function? If this is true, it is called logarithm. So, where are we proved? Okay. So, basically this is uh, the essence of concavity. So, let us go back this side. Okay. Okay, this is there, this is there, this is there. So, let us use only this part. Okay. So, we want to prove this. Okay, this is what eventually we want to prove. So, let us look at a1 and a2. As I said, if any one of them is 0, the inequality is trivial. So, we will not worry about that case. So, a1 and a2 are positive. So, one of them must be <coughs> less than you. If both are equal again it is trivial. Just substitute a1 equal to a2 and use the fact that lambda oh did I say lambda 1 plus lambda 2 equal to 1 that has to be taken care of here. Otherwise it is nonsense okay absurd inequality. Okay. So, if a1 equal to a2 again it is obvious okay just put a1 equal to a2 both sides are be uh, turn out to be the same. So, there is really nothing to be proved. So, the only non trivial case when a 1 is not equal to a 2 and both are non 0. So, we have without loss of generality you assume a 1 is smaller than a 2 because symmetric in a 1 and a 2 you call the smaller one as a 1 and the smaller as bigger one as a 2. So, here is a 1 this 0 here is a 1 and a 2 is there. Okay. Now, pick a point t somewhere for a take take a t somewhere in between. Now, if we take any point between t and a 2, it can be written as a convex combination of t and a 2. So, if you take this point let us take that point lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2 it will be a point in between the two. Okay. So, that is uh, the thing that we are going to use. Now, what can we say therefore, t is less than lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2. Okay. Therefore, 1 over lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2 is less than 1 over t. Okay. The job is done, just integrate you get the result. Okay. So, now we integrate with both sides, both are now real valued continuous functions etcetera, etcetera. Let us assume all that is known. Uh, so, a 1 to a 2 d t by lambda 1 t plus lambda 2 a 2 is less than integral a 1 to a 2 d t t. Okay. Does it matter? We have, all we want to prove is less than or equal to. What is the integral of this? You all know. If you do not know, say you know this lambda 1 lambda 2 a 2 the modulus actually everything is positive a 1 to a 2 that is less than or equal to log a 1 
a2 minus log a1. Now, if we substitute all this, it is 1 over lambda 1 log lambda 1 a2 plus lambda 2 a2. So, a2 into lambda 1 plus lambda 2, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 1. So, it is just log a2 minus log lambda 1 a1 plus lambda 2 a2 is less than log a2 minus log a1 and push this to that side, push everything to this side, you get what you want. You get uh, lambda 1 log a1 plus 1 minus lambda 1 which is lambda 2 log a2 is less than log lambda 1 a1 plus lambda and that proves this stuff. So, that is our uh, next inequality g lambda a the weighted geometric mean is uh, the what is it that we have really used uh, in this fact is the, the fact that the derivative of the logarithm is decreasing. The derivative of the logarithm is decreasing because it is 1 over t. So, if this point is to the right of this point, then that will be 1 over that will be less than 1 over t. So, if we take any function phi for which the second derivative is negative, the derivative will be decreasing. You can replace the log and get a phi, you get a new inequality. This is a generalized arithmetic geometric mean inequality. Instead of log, uh, if you state at this stage, you say la lambda 1 phi of a1 plus lambda 2 phi of a2 less than or equal to phi of lambda 1 a1 plus lambda 2 a2, where phi is a concave function, second derivative less than 0, that is the, a generalized mean result, arithmetic geometric mean. That is the right hand side is a generalized arithmetic mean, the left hand side is a generalized geometric mean with respect to, yeah concave function phi okay concave means the second derivative is less than this uh, or the derivative is decreasing second derivative is less than zero so your more general i will not write this uh, is g uh, g lambda phi a is less than equal to a lambda phi a phi concave Okay, so that is the uh, fundamental inequalities that we will be using. Okay, so therefore, there is nothing really uh, sensationally uh, uh, super duper mathematics involved in it. Essentially, we are uh, looking at uh, the right way of applying this. In all these things, you can look at it carefully and say when equality holds, okay, that is uh, not a big difficult problem. Okay, so now we are going to apply this generalized fellow to various situations. Okay, the generalized arithmetic mean, geometric mean, not even the phi right up to only up to this, this uh, the third inequality, we are going to apply to different situations and slowly build up. So, this is a consequence of 2, this is a consequence of the concavity, it is a generalization of this which itself comes from this. So, the source for all this is the fact that x squared is greater than or equal to 0 for every real number x. Okay. So, now I am going to move a little bit further up. Okay. So, suppose I have two vectors in the n-dimensional space Rn x1, y1, y2, xn and y1, y2, yn both are in Rn. Then for any i, fix an i, okay, so fix an i. Define a1 to be mod xi squared a2 to be mod y i squared okay. and lambda 1 
equal to lambda 2 equal to 1 half. Okay. Then what does this, all these inequalities tell you? What is that case lambda 1 equal to lambda 2 equal to half? It is the standard geometric mean and the standard arithmetic mean. So, we will have square root of a1 into square root of a2 is less than or equal to a1 by 2 plus a2 by 2. That is the geometric this is by 2. I need only this. That is exactly what the geometric arithmetic. The weightage is given equal. That is what the, the classical arithmetic mean geometric mean is. So, what does that tell? Square root of a1 is mod x1 and square root of a2 is mod y1. So, mod xi yi is less than or equal to a1 mod yi squared by 2. I have taken a1 to be mod xi squared, a2 to be mod yi squared and uh, the weightages are half half. Now, this is true, I can do it for i equal to 1, i equal to 2, i equal to 3, etc. For each i, which is now true. Now, I add all of them. What do I get? Summation mod xi yi is less than or equal to summation mod xi squared by 2 plus summation mod yi squared by 2 i equal to 1 to n i equal to 1 to n i equal to 1 to n. Okay. So, let us take suppose this was 1 and this was 1 that will become half plus half 1. So, suppose summation mod x i squared equal to summation mod y i squared equal to 1. That is what you call as unit vectors, ok. They are all unit vectors. Sum of the squares of the components is equal to 1. They are both x and y are unit vectors. Then summation mod x i y i is less than equal to 1. Okay, so, this is I will I will not conclude it, but I will make a suppose now for general if summation i equal to 1 to n mod i square is not a unit vector, suppose it was some alpha and i equal to 1 to n y i squared is some beta. Alpha equal to beta equal to 1, we have got that case. So, in general, the vector length need not be equal to alpha 1. So, we are taking the general case. Then define x i tilde to be x i by square root of alpha and y i tilde is equal to y i by square root of beta. Now, what is the guarantee that alpha and beta are not 0? Well, if alpha and beta are 0, one of the vectors is 0, then what we are going to prove is going to be trivial. So, those trivial cases we will remove, ok. So, we are assuming the non-trivial cases. Then, these x i tilde and y i tilde are unit vectors. Therefore, I can apply that star. Therefore, by star, I have i equal to 1 to n x i by square root of alpha y i by square root of beta is less than or equal to 1 or summation x i y i is less than or equal to square root of alpha and square root of beta. So, let me sum it up here. Where do I space? This is phi. Then summation i equal to 1 to n, I will leave some space and then write this summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i y i is less than or equal to square root of alpha into square root of summation i equal to 1 to n 
mod y i square. Now you see that because I put the mod, I did not put x i squared which is normal because it is real, but if you put the mod and work the same proof will go for complex also. You should have taken real vectors, you could have taken a complex vectors, okay. This is the famous Cauchy original starting Cauchy Schwartz inequality, very famous Cauchy Schwartz inequality. This is called Cauchy Schwartz inequality for in Rn, Rn or Cn. So now I will write similar, okay. What I, I said I leave some space here, I can also write this. because the modulus of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the moduli. So, I can also write that. And equality holds if and only if x, y are linearly dependent. One must be a multiple of the other. That is very easy. At each step, uh, you will get that result. Okay. That is little tricky, but anybody can prove it. So, this is called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We will push this thing to the limit, okay. I mean, in the sense that even raise these inequalities to a higher level, okay. At the moment, we will keep it at this. So, my uh, space is getting reduced, so I must be on this side only. Anyway, at some stage, I will erase those things. So. Now, I am going to give a, a little bit more generalization of this uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and that is called the Holder's inequality. The, therefore, the Cauchy-Schwarz becomes a uh, Holder's inequality. So, now let us take uh, PQ such that 1 less than P, both, both of them are between 1 and infinity, okay. The greater than 0, less than 1. Uh, the greater than 1 and less than infinity. So, I can choose lambda 1 as 1 by p, lambda 2 as 1 by q. So, I will choose this p and q such that 1 by p plus 1 by q equal to 1, okay. So, p and q, any two real numbers lying between 1 and infinity such that 1 by p plus 1 by q equal to 1, such a pair is called a conjugate pair. Okay. We call p q as a conjugate pair. There is, there is a reason for that word conjugate a little later probably you will see it, okay. So, once it is there, the 1 over p is less than 1, 1 over q is less than 1 and there is some lambda 1 plus lambda 2 equal to 1. So, they work well because we wanted always this lambda 1, lambda 2 equal to 1. So, now what I do is, I do similar thing that I did for Cauchy-Schwarz. In Cauchy Schwartz, I distributed equal weightage half half lambda 1 equal to half lambda 2 equal to half and applied the classical inequality of arithmetic geometry. Now, I put the weighted instead of half of P and Q. So, I take A1 to be mod Xi to the power of P, A2 to be mod yi to the power of q, lambda 1 to be 1 by p, lambda 2 to be 1 by q. Then apply 3. 3 is the weighted arithmetic geometric mean inequality. So, what does that say? That says uh, a1 power lambda 1, a2 power lambda 2 is less than or equal to lambda 1 a1 plus lambda 2 a2. Let us substitute the values for lambda 1, lambda 2, a1, a2. a1 power lambda 1, so xi to the power of p to the power of 1 over p, so it is mod xi. Similarly, the other one is mod yi, which I write as mod x i y i. Again, I get mod x i y i for the left hand side. The right hand side is mod x i to the power of p by p 
plus mod yi to the power of q by q. Now true for each one of the components I can do this. Same as before, add them all. So what do you get? Summation mod xi yi i equal to 1 to n is less than or equal to summation mod xi to the power of p by p plus summation mod yi to the power of q by q 1 to n 1 to n. Exactly like last time in place of 2 we have in place of 1 by 2 we have p in place of 1 by uh, 2 the other 1 by 2 we have q. Now the first thing we did was suppose this was 1 and this was 1, then I will get 1 half plus 1 half, I will get 1. So, similarly, if this is 1 and this is 1, then 1 by p plus 1 by q, because they are conjugate 1 by p plus 1 by q is equal to 1. So, suppose the first thing we get is summation xi p i equal to 1 to n equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i q equal to 1 implies summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i y i is less than or equal to 1 by p plus 1 by q which is 1. So, for unit vectors we got this. What did we do before? If we did not have a unit vector, we divided by the length and use the fact. Okay. So, if summation mod x i power p is equal to alpha, summation mod y i power q is equal to beta. Then we define x i tilde to be x i by alpha to the power of 1 by p, y i tilde to be y i to be beta to the power of 1 over q. Then if you substitute all this, you get this inequality. The same thing. Uh, a okay 6 holder 1 by p plus 1 by q equal to 1 0 less than p q less than 1 after uh, 1 less than infinity implies mod summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i y i which is less than is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of q to the power of 1 over q. This is called the Holder's inequality. If you put p equal to q equal to 2, 1 over 2 in the Holder's inequality you get Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So Cauchy-Schwarz is only a special case of Holder but that came first so that has its uh, position uh, so colder came as a generalization of cauchy schwarz so these are all very fundamental inequalities we will extend them further okay okay now that so probably i will start from this end now For the time being, the last in this series is the following. These will all be used immediately. Okay. Now, same notation as. Okay, not the same notation. Mm, okay. Okay. Now I am going to look at see th these are all something like inner product in, uh, inequalities. Now I am going to look at like norm inequality. That's how we will be using them. Okay. This is like the sum of the two vectors. Looking at the components of the sum of the two vectors. So xi plus yi to the power of p, I am going to write it in a special form, then apply holders. Okay. 
the moment i have a p between 1 and infinity q is the conjugate index what does that means 1 over p plus 1 over q is 1 now i am going to write this in a special form mod xi plus yi to the power of p minus 1 into mod xi plus yi. One power I have taken out of the p exponent p, I have taken 1 outside the remaining p minus 1 I have kept there. Now for this I will apply our standard triangle inequality mod xi plus yi is less than or equal to mod xi plus mod yi. So this is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod xi plus yi into mod xi plus mod yi. Okay, so net is therefore summation i equal to 1 to n mod xi plus yi to the power of p is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod xi into mod xi plus yi to the power of p minus 1 plus summation i equal to 1 to n mod yi into mod xi plus yi to the power of p minus 1. Okay. Now I will call this as 1 and this as 2 so that I do not have to write again and again. So now look at 1. I want to apply Holder's inequality. In the Holder's inequality I must have the product of two things. Okay. So I will take as this fellow the first fellow and that fellow the second fellow. So this is this is my new xi, this is my new yi. So, this will be nu xi to the power of p that is this to the power of p plus this will be the nu yi to the power of q that means this to the power of q. So, 1 less than or equal to holder summation i equal to 1 to n mod xi to the power of p to the power of 1 over p into summation i equal to 1 to n the new yi to the power of q. So, it is p minus 1 to the power of times q xi plus yi modulus p minus 1 to the power of q to the power of 1 over I suppose that correct? Yeah, that is right. Right? So, in place of this xi, you take the in place of this xi, you take xi, in place of this xi, you take xi plus yi to the power of p minus 1, then apply that. Okay. So, this is what the new yi is, this is the new xi is. Now, what is p minus 1 times q? If you look at uh, 1 over p plus 1 over q equal to 1. So, multiply by pq. So, p plus q is equal to pq. So, p minus 1 into q. You take it to that side. p is equal to p minus 1 into q. So, p minus 1 into q is p. So, that is summation i equal to 1 to n mod xi to the power of p to the power of 1 over p summation i equal to 1 to n mod xi plus yi to the power of p to the power of 1 over q. Right. So, it is simply applying the Holder's inequality with some very special choices for the two vectors. One vector is the same as the x vector. The second vector is a combination of the x and the y vector. Then this is what I get for 1. What will I get for 2? The only difference between 1 and 2 is this xi is replaced by this yi. So, it will I will get similarly 2 
is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of p into the there is no change in this term right so now what do i get eventually therefore this 1 plus 2 is the dominant for that fellow so we have summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p is less than or equal to this factor is common for both of them. So, it is summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p is a 1 over p plus summation i equal to 1 to n mod y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p times the common factor is summation i equal to 1 to n mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over q. So, divide take it to the other side I have to make sure it is not 0 well if it is 0 what does that say one of the vectors is 0 so everything will be falling apart. So, the 0 case do not worry about you can trivially handle it. So, bring it to this side I get summation i equal to 1 to n x i plus y i to the power of p I had a 1 power I am going to subtract a 1 over q power because that will come in the denominator. So, it will be minus 1 over q that is less than or equal to this term. What is 1 minus 1 over q? 1 over p because 1 over p plus 1 over q is 1. So, I get mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p is less than or equal to x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p. And this is what is known as Minkowitz case inequality. Okay, so the sixth inequality is our Minkowitz key. So, I do not know how many i's he has at the end. Some people spell it with the two i's, some people with one i. Okay. Minkowitz key x y belongs to R n. Similarly, for C n because everything with modulus same thing will work or n or C n or 1 less than p less than infinity implies summation mod x i plus y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p is less than or equal to These are first set of fundamental inequalities. Arithmetic geometric mean, weighted arithmetic geometric mean, then we have the generalized arithmetic geometric mean with concave functions, then we have Cauchy Schwartz, Wolders inequality, and then the Minkowski's inequality. I think uh, I do not know how many times these things have been used. And, uh, well, most of the time uh, I used to have a analyst teacher whenever he wanted to, uh, he said if you do not know simply shout by hold this inequality and write the inequality you want. Many people will uh, think before they question because it most of the time it is Holder or Hoshi Schwartz or Minkowski. If it involves product form, you try to say by Holder it is obvious or by Cauchy Schwartz is obvious, but it is not that obvious. But these are very important inequalities. They come by, they come very often in the proofs. Okay. Now, let me see what I can do. Okay. Uh, I, I do not want to start something new. So, I will probably uh, look at 
these fellows only little bit more carefully. I'll see how I can push them. Now let me uh, let me look at these things a little bit. Uh, well, okay, let me be discreet first only. Um, what are the Cauchy Schwartz? This was the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, right? Now, suppose I am not going to deal with any more vectors with finite number of components, but I deal with uh, vectors with a countably infinite number of components, which means each vector is a sequence. So, suppose I have x equal to x1, x2, etc infinite y equal to y1, y2, etc. All are real or complex you take, does not matter. So, I have a sequence of components. So, now I am moving from finite dimension to infinite dimension. No longer finite number of components, but there are an infinite number of components. But whatever it is, for the first n this will be valid. I can take n equal to 10 or n equal to 100 or n equal to 1000. For the first thousand components, I can apply this inequality. Then i equal to 1 to n mod xi yi is less than or equal to i equal to 1 to n mod xi squared square root i equal to 1 to n mod y squared square root for every n. For every n, this can be done. Take that many components, apply cauchy schwarz inequality and that will become valid. But suppose not only these are like this, that whole thing itself is finite. That whole thing itself is finite. Not only summation mod x i squared up to n, I can add all the way up to infinity, still I will get a finite quantity, okay. What probably is a discrete finite energy signal, okay, with an infinite number of time components, okay. So, so suppose I have this vector such that the sum of the squares of the components, all of them put together is an infinite series and that is a convergent infinite series, that is finite. Then I can write this as that this fellow will be less than or equal to the full series, this fellow will be less than or equal to the full series. So, this will be square root of i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i squared times square root of i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i squared mod y i squared. Okay. So, for every n, this fellow is smaller than this fellow. This is a fixed quantity now. This is a number, that is a number and that is a finite number because that series converges. So, for every n, this fellow is dominated by this. So, if I let n go to infinity, that series will also be dominated by this. So, I will get summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i y i is less than or equal to so what does this result say that if i have vectors with infinite number of components such that the sums of the squares is always finite then this series not only converges, it is dominated by this. That series summation x i y i is forced to converge and it is sum is dominated by this product of the lengths. This is the generalized Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for such 
infinite component vector. So, so we are going to look at infinite component vectors for which the sum of the squares of the components is finite. These are denoted by L2. L2 is equal to the set of all vectors with infinite number of components such that summation mod xi squared is finite. Look at all those vectors for this is finite. Then if you take uh, then this is denoted by, okay, let me not use that terminology, then x y belongs to L2 implies summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i y i is less than or equal to mod x i square square root. This is what is known as Cauchy-Schwarz in L2. Now, of course, uh, it, uh, if, if all these are real, it is the real L2 space and if all these are complex, it is the complex L2 space, okay. because both, for both it is true. So, we have no push Cauchy Schwartz. Uh, this is the uh, thing that we learn at vectors, vector level mod x dot y is less than or equal to the length of x into the length of y into cos theta. And since cos theta is less than 1, the le x dot y is less than or equal to the length of x into length of y, okay. That has now pushed all the way up to infinite number of component vectors with finite length, okay. This is how the uh, cauchy schwarz generalizes to infinite number of components. How will Holder generalize? Here both I took this to be finite, this to be finite because my, my weightages were equally distributed. But I must in the holder case take x such that not this is finite, but pth power is finite and y to be in qth power to be finite. So, Lp and Lq I have to take. Then if x is in Lp, y is in Lq mod x i y i will be less than or equal to here p to the power of 1 over p there q to the power of 1 over q. So, that is the generalized uh, uh, holder inequality. So, in general we define L p for 1 less than p less than infinity to be the set of all vectors with infinite number of components sub that mod x i to the power of p converges. Then the Holder's inequality is generalized to the following. The Holder is PQ 1 by P plus 1 by Q equal to 1. Then X belongs to LP, Y belongs to LQ implies summation I equal to 1 to infinity mod XI YI is less than or equal to summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p into summation i equal to 1 to infinity mod y i to the power of q. That is the uh, Holder's inequality for this LP spaces. Okay. Now, we add one more Minkowski's inequality. What will that be? If you look at the Minkowski's inequality, in both we get summation mod x i to the power of p, summation mod y i to the power of p. So, if we have now x and y in L p, x y in L p implies summation mod x i y i, x i plus y i to the power of p i equal to 1 to infinity to the power of 1 over p is less than or equal to mod x i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p plus mod y i to the power of p to the power of 1 over p. 1 to infinity, 1 to infinity. This is the Minkowski. 
for this generation. Okay, so it is just that one uh, acorn or what that x squared is greater than or equal to 0 if and only if for all real numbers and equal to 0 if and only if x is equal to 0 uh, takes you all the way up to uh, the inequalities for vectors with infinite number of components. And now you want to further generalize instead of a discrete components I must take a continuum. So instead of x i being a discrete function I take x of t. So if x of t and y of t are reasonable function that is where certain uh, uh, because integration comes into the picture. But the idea is clear if x of t and y of t are functions such that what will happen the sum will become integral mod x t squared is less than infinity then integral mod x t y t will be less than or equal to integral mod x t square square root into integral mod y t square square root okay. That is the first fundamental Schwarz inequality for integral. Similarly every one of these the integrals will be replaced you will get Holder's inequality for integrals you will get Minkowski's inequality for integrals. So the, the fundamental fact that x squared greater than or equal to 0 for real numbers takes you all the way to a very serious levels of uh, inequalities. Okay. All these inequalities are very fundamental and uh, they will be repeatedly used in uh, umpteen number of times in all the proofs. I okay. will do the integral inequalities a little uh, later more, uh, more detail. Okay. Now with this we are a little better equipped uh, to give a possible generalization. Okay. okay, so what I will do in the next class is the following. Okay. You take the real numbers, okay. In the real numbers, there are the same thing that modulus r can be interpreted in many, many ways, okay. So, for example, suppose r is in r, there is something called modulus of r. Okay. And what are the properties of this modulus of r? It is greater than or equal to 0, etc., etc. Remember, equal to 0 if and only if r equal to 0, there may be right like that. And equal to 0 if and only if r equal to 0, modulus of r s is equal to mod r to mod s and modulus of r plus s is less than equal to mod r plus mod s. Now you generalize this, you take a vector space and then corresponding to every vector you associate a number which we call it as norm x such that it obeys all this. Norm x is greater than or equal to 0, equal to 0 if and only if x equal to 0 vector and norm of alpha x is mod alpha into norm x. So this is the effect of there are two operations in the vector space, one is scalar multiplication. What happens to the norm under scalar multiplication? The other operation in the vector space is addition what happens to the norm under addition that copies this inequality. If we have such an association it is called a norm and you get a norm linear space. Now whatever proofs that you can go give in real numbers using modulus can be correspondingly copied as far as possible to norm linear spaces except whenever you are using some very special property of the real number that may not be there. If you are using only the properties of the modulus then the corresponding things can be carried over. So that leads you, so from the real line you go to the ideas of normal linear space. And similarly,
the distance between two real numbers can be defined as take the difference and take how much is the absolute value and this can be generalized to the notion of a metric space and of course the product rs that can be generalized to what is known as an inner product space the product is in such a way that if you take the product of a number with itself you get the square which is modulus r squared that will connect to the norm so okay so there is an inner product space so the same seed the real number seed will give you several directions to proceed go in the direction of non linear spaces you can go in the direction of metric spaces you can go in the direction of inner product spaces and the metric spaces if you now generalize you get what are known as general topological spaces so the topological spaces are the most general special types of this are metric spaces and special types of this are non linear spaces and special types of this are the inner product spaces okay and uh, what we will do is we'll go only up to this from the if it will when we will say something of for the real line what does it say in the general metric what is the corresponding thing in the general metric space what is the corresponding thing in an, once i say what is the thing in the metric space because this is a special case we will get for this because this is a special case we will get for that also so we will take the real line and the real numbers study the real numbers simultaneously say what are the possible generalizations available for metric spaces non linear spaces and inner product spaces so next time we'll start with this analysis okay this right time but remember all the inequalities i'll be using them